Good morning. Thank you, Elena and Samuel and Kristen. We're in Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. Last week we looked at chapter 13. We talked about submitting to the governing authorities. We talked about applying that to government and law enforcement. Then he went into loving our neighbors and then into just us living like we're called to live, to put on Christ, to to represent Him in our lives. He called us to a sense of urgency to stop living lifestyles of sin, to stop living lifestyles of partying and drunkenness, to stop living lives of sexual immorality, to stop living lives of disunity through gossip and other harmful things that we do to cause disunity in the body of Christ. And He said, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. So then He transitions right from calling us to live right in, at the end of chapter 13 to chapter 14 and verse 1 when he says, Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. So he's saying that there are different levels of spiritual maturity in the Christian life. And so he, when he says one who is weak in the faith, just keep in mind he is talking about a believer He's just saying that there are strong people in the faith and, and weak people in the faith. And as we read through this passage, it'll kind of make it more clear of what he means by somebody who's weak in the faith. Somebody who may have less of an understanding on certain areas, so therefore their life may still be a little different in some areas. They may still do things a certain way, thinking that, it's something religious when maybe it's really not. It may just be a tradition or a habit. But he's talking about those that are stronger, those who have a more mature understanding of the Word of God, how how we are to behave towards those that might be weaker. So right at the beginning, we have an opportunity to sin in the way of arrogance, of assuming that we're the strong ones and the people that do things different from us are the weak ones. And that would be thinking of ourselves too highly, which in chapter 12, remember, he warned us a lot about that. In chapter 12, verse 3, he said, For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. And then, down in uh, chapter 12, verse 16, he said, Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. So he's warning us again about the dangers of, of an intellectual, spiritual arrogance, of, of thinking too highly of ourselves. So we just need to remember that application here in chapter 14 for this entire chapter he's going to be talking about this so receive one who is weak in the faith so he's talking about the unity of believers about he doesn't want us nitpicking and arguing about every little thing and so he refers to these in verse 1 in my translation in chapter 14 verse 1 he says over doubtful things so we need to keep that in mind with this whole chapter, that he's not talking about major issues of the faith. He's not talking about clear issues of this is right, this is wrong. So he's not wanting us to be passive and not, not to stand for things that matter. Remember that the whole framework of this message, this chapter 14, is on issues of doubtful things. So these are those minor things. So let's remember that at this time that what you have going on here is you have Jewish people who have grown up with all of these Jewish traditions. And they go way back into their family's history. You know, starting with things like circumcision. Things like all these dietary laws. This you can eat. This you can eat. If it's not kosher, you can't eat it. And then he gets into days. Okay, he's going to talk about days. Now, we know about the Sabbath, 
that's in the Bible very clear what, what God expects of a, of a day of rest, of one in seven, of setting a day aside. And, and he goes into deep teaching in the, in the New Testament how that's for our benefit because God knows we need rest because God knows that we are not indestructible. And so he put that there for our own good. But what he's talking about here when he talks about days that we'll get into in a minute would be all these festivals and these these special days of, well, this is a fasting day. Well, this is a feast day. Well, so you have a, these Jewish believers who had placed their faith in Jesus as the Messiah and are Christians. But they're still Jews. They're simply Jews who have acknowledged that Jesus is the Messiah. So you have these people with their long-standing traditions worshiping in the same church body with Gentile believers who just got saved. And they don't have any of this baggage. They've never been taught about circumcision and, and they made it clear in the New Testament that they don't need to be. That you can be circumcised if you want to be. You don't have to be. It has nothing to do with anything. It's It was a symbolism that they used to have way back, going back to the covenant with Abraham, and that in the New Testament they made it clear that the Gentile believers did not need to be circumcised when they got saved, that in the New Testament what they looked for for that symbolism was baptism, was being baptized not as an infant, not because your parents or grandparents thought it was a good idea, but to be baptized because it was your own decision to say, I am saved, I am a believer in Christ, and I am not ashamed to, in front of my church family, be associated as a follower of Christ, that I am unashamed to stand and to say, I believe in Christ. I have confessed and been forgiven of my sins, and now I am baptized. It, it's a symbolic of the gospel, of going down into the water, just like Jesus was buried in the grave, and then to come up out of the water, like Jesus came up out of the grave and has a new life in Christ. So they, they had these disagreements over circumcision. So from a Jewish standpoint of legalism, these doubtful things, like you could you could say, well, you know, we're the chosen people, and so we're better than these Gentiles, and we're more righteous because we do more of these ceremonial things. Whereas if you were a Gentile, you might have been thinking, we're free in Christ, all that stuff is stupid, and I just don't get it, I don't know why they waste their time on such matters, and they might have even made fun of these Jewish believers, for some of their Jewish customs. Now, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to realize how harmful that would be for fellowship in a church body if you have two groups that are disrespecting one another, right? But we're not just talking about then. Obviously, he wants us to get this now. So now, in today's time, there are a long list of doubtful things that you could argue about. You're going to have different groups of people that fall into different camps on so many things. What kind of music should we sing? How should we sing it? What kind of instruments are acceptable? What kind of instruments are unacceptable, if any? And the opinions on that subject alone divide fellowship. What about the version of Scripture that's used in worship? What about people that say, well, there's only one acceptable one and all the other ones are fakes? Well, what if you have one of those other ones? Now you're dis you've been disrespected. Somebody's disrespected the Word of God because they think there's only one copy that's good enough. And so you have all these different issues, and you can think of your own, but just remember, we're talking about doubtful things. We're talking about matters of opinion, matters of tradition, we're not talking about things that are spelled out clearly in the Scripture. These are things where he's calling us to be conscientious. He's causing us, calling us to be patient of one another. So the sermon title is Showing Consideration for Others. 
So he goes on and he says, For one believes he may eat all things. So right off the bat he's talking about food. And that's probably my problem is that I want to eat all things. right? For one believes he may eat all things. But he who is weak eats only vegetables. So notice how he's talking about the strong and the weak. He's saying that the stronger person spiritually actually does have a handle on his freedom in Christ to let go of some of the legalism of the Old Testament. And there was a, the vision that Peter had in Acts where Jesus showed him, hey, these are clean. Don't call unclean what God has called clean. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. He was saying, stop living by the old Jewish traditions. We're going out to win Gentiles for Christ. And if you try to carry the baggage of the legalism from the Old Testament into the New Covenant, it's going to be a barrier to people being saved. He's saying the purpose of those days has passed. And so he equates the person that sees that freedom in his diet, not to have all these categories of foods he can't eat, as being the stronger one. But then the weaker person has all these limitations and all of these rules. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. And now we're talking about consideration, aren't, aren't we? So instead of arguing, hey, so read the passage about Peter. I'm right, you're wrong, you're weak, and I'm strong, and I'm right, and you're wrong, and hey, let's have unity and fellowship. He's saying, no, that's, that's going to be divisive. So he gets into the application of not being judgmental on these on these small matters let let not him who eats despise him who does not eat and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats for god has received him he's saying in these situations of these doubtful things saying you're both believers so why would you be divisive why would you bring disunity into the fellowship because you're arguing over petty things who are you to judge? Another's servant. So, if I go into some, somebody's business and the owner is present and sees what's going on, who am I to correct the worker? He's not working for me, is he? He's working for the owner. He says, who are you to judge another servant? Let, let that master handle his own business. And in this case, the judge would be God, ultimately. To his own master, he stands or, fa or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able <clears throat> to make him stand. Now, verse 4 is kind of a long way about saying, mind your own business. He's saying, don't think that as a mature believer in, in our own eyes, that we become the spiritual police and that it's our job to correct everyone on petty little things. He says, God is able to make him stand. So this is kind of comes into play, although there are definitely times where God wants us to act, wants us to intervene, wants us to speak up, wants us to step in. He's saying these doubtful things are areas where we're to back off, let God change a person's heart. Let God be one to, over time, show people the air of their way. And don't be too harsh in correcting and trying to nitpick and micromanage every aspect of somebody's business. Mind your own business. A lot of people have to go through that maybe when they become grandparents of, of watching their children raise children. And in their mind, they're still kids, but no, they're adults with their own kids. And so sometimes grandparents are like, we didn't do it that way, you know. But, you know, sometimes that causes tension and they have to realize we had our opportunity to be parents. And and now it's our, it's our kids and their spouse's opportunity to be parents. And so we have to recognize that we don't get to decide when they go to bed, when they get up, what they eat, what they don't eat, when they take their naps, and all those kinds of things. 
And so that can be tough to kind of say, ah, that's not my place. Now, if I see a kid running into the street, that's time to take action, right? Not time to call a meeting with the parents. But as far as those doubtful things, those, you know, those matters of preference of how people do details, we kind of got to back off and say, I'm going to mind my own business. I'm not, I'm not going to intervene. I'm not going to drive a wedge uh, in my children's relationship with their spouse and their, their children. So then he goes on and he transitions into days. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. And he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat, to the Lord he does not eat, and gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. So he's talking about these days, and he's like, it really doesn't matter. He's not talking about sinful days. He's not talking about days where they're worshiping idols and all. He's just saying that there are some special days in certain traditions, uh, whether it be Jewish traditions or family traditions. So you will find, even today, that Jewish believers have Jewish festival days and fasting days and things of that nature that they'll still observe. Now, who am I to judge them over that? They're not sinning. It's, it has a meaning. They're very particular about what it means, about why they do it. Now, if they're days that are not, you know, if they're days that are sinful, that are highlighting sin or whatever it might be, well then, you know, that's a little different. I mean, he's talking about doubtful things. He's talking about days that are spiritually neutral, okay, pretty much. So, He's just saying, Let, let's focus on bigger things. Let's not judge each other because we're not doing this on this day or, or this on that day. And in verse 7, he really calls our attention to what is important. He's been talking about what's not important. He says, For none of us lives to himself and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. Therefore let us not judge one another any more, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. This verse 13 is a key verse in this entire chapter. So instead of being petty and nitpicky about what foods so, such and such has on their plate and what day they think is special, he reminds us, first of all, if you're both believers... And why do you want to divide over that? Kind of reminding us as believers, we're going to spend eternity together in heaven. So instead of bickering and fighting and, and looking for areas we disagree on to divide us, why would we not be unified? Why would we drive a wedge between us when God is going to take care of it? And so even though he's talking about believers for most of this chapter, he does broaden it a little bit here when he talks in verse 11, when he quotes uh, from reference to Isaiah chapter 45, verse 23 in the Old Testament. He says, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God, and that reminds me in the New Testament of Philippians 2, 10 and 11, when he writes, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, those that have died, those that are living. 
and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. At the end times, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord, both the believers and the non-believers. But for the non-believers at that point, it will be too late. It's not going to be their moment of salvation. It's going to be their moment of truth where they've realized and come to grips with the fact that they've denied the Lord Jesus Christ until the end. And so it's very sobering when we think about all the bickering and, and the conflict, and, and sometimes we probably all had this happen. Unfortunately, maybe even as adults, we've maybe even had this happen. Hope probably all, all have. But certainly as children, where you get into a fight, maybe it's a yapping fight of the mouth with a brother or a sister or a friend, or maybe it's a fist fight, a physical altercation with a kid on a playground. And ultimately, you're going to have to answer this question. What are you fighting about? He took my eraser. Now you have a bloody nose. Was it worth it? Do you have another eraser? Because this has been handled differently. Maybe both of your clothes are ruined at that point. You've been in a mud puddle. and it's like, Yeah, this is kind of stupid. So over an eraser. So that's probably how they felt as he's writing this. And they know that they're disunified. And they know it's over stupid stuff. And now he's talking about eternity and Jesus dying on the cross for their sins and rising from the grave and how... All the saved and lost are going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we're arguing and judging one another on what food is on their plate. They would have been shamed. They gossiped about somebody observing a day that they didn't agree with. So he includes then shortly both the lost and the saved. And in verse 12, so then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Not to one another, to God. So he's saying he doesn't have to justify to you why that's his diet or why he observes that day or why his family observes circumcision and you don't. He's going to stand before God and give an account of everything and those things probably aren't going to be high on God's list. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore. He says, stop it. But rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. This is where the application really gets in now, that he's set the stage. He says, this is ridiculous. This is what's important. Now in verse 14, it's the application. He talked to us last week in chapter 13, verses 8 through 10 about loving our neighbor. So this is how we do it. How do we handle this in the body of Christ? I know and am convinced by the Lord, in verse 14, by the Lord Jesus, that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. So the Apostle Paul is saying, hey, I am settled on the issue. I've studied, I've read, I listen to God, and there are no unclean foods. But, to my fellow believer, who in his mind still believes a certain food to be unclean, in his thoughts and application, it's still unclean. So how am I, with my understanding, going to get along with that person who thinks differently than me? Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you're no longer walking in love. So if I go to lunch with somebody and they're offended, if I have a certain kind of meat, I shouldn't have it. I'm not going to die going a meal without that, am I? I'm going to have it the next meal if I want. But if they're offended and I'm aware of their beliefs, even if I don't agree with them. He's saying, you know, isn't that what being considerate means? 
that I kind of go out of my way to say, you know what? Instead of having the attitude that I'm going to do whatever I want and that's just tough if you don't think it's okay, that you know what? Why would I want to put a stumbling block between me and, and this friend of mine? I had a situation once where I was an engineering intern. I got to live in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, right near Boston for uh, a couple of summers. And they would give me roommates in this suite in this dorm at, at MIT. And we were right on the Charles River. I could see the sick go sign at Fenway Park out my window the first summer I was there. And one of my roommates was um, a Hindu from the country of India. And I didn't know a lot about that, but I knew he didn't eat meat. And so one day, you know, I was, everything that I owned fit in a Mustang hatchback back then. And so my kitchen utensils considered of one pot. My pots and pans was singular. Pot, you know, just one. That's it. So I had this predicament. I was trying to make spaghetti. Well, you need two for that. You got to boil the water. You got to throw in the spaghetti and you got to heat up the sauce. And so I'm trying to make spaghetti. And my friend uh, Jayesh was, was there and I knew that he had utensils in the kitchen. We had a common area. We had our own rooms and then we shared a big bathroom and we shared a, a kitchen and a, and a sitting area and we each had our own little dorm room. So uh, I went and I asked Jayesh, I said, I'm, I'm making uh, spaghetti and I was wondering if I could use your, I've already got the noodles going and I was wondering if I could use your pot to, to heat up the sauce. And I could tell as soon as I asked he, and he says, um, very politely and respectfully, I don't eat meat, and my pot can't be used to heat up meat. And so this particular jar of prego that I had, had no meat in it. It was just a traditional, just a regular jar of prego and on the ingredients. It was just tomato stuff and no meat. So I showed him the ingredients. I said, Jay, this doesn't have any meat in it. It's just, it's just tomatoes. And you eat tomatoes and... And so he looked at the jar. I could tell he was straining on the inside. I said, how about this? What if I take my spaghetti water and pour it into your pot? Or, or vice versa. Yeah, but yeah, that. And what if I take my spaghetti water, put it in your pot, and then um, I use my pot to heat up the, the tomato sauce? He goes, okay, okay. So we figured it out, and the moral of this story is I did get to eat my spaghetti. It was great. And so, but he wasn't offended then, right? I mean, I, what if I would have said, well, that's just ridiculous. I mean, you're not eating it, it's, it's just your pot. Or then it said, well, it's even more ridiculous because I just proved to you this doesn't contain any meat. But in his mind, he associated spaghetti sauce with meat because most spaghetti sauce has meat in it. So why would I want to bring that? We already had so many differences and we had to live in the same space for three months that why would I want heating up spaghetti sauce to be a, a problem? It doesn't have to be. Things like that, he's saying, be considerate. Show consideration. Do things a little differently, not because you're weak, but because you respect somebody else and they may not be where you're at. But this is the telling statement here. Do not, this is in verse 15, do not destroy, do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. We could learn a lot from that if we care about other people. What kind of actions do we take on doubtful things that could destroy somebody's opportunity for coming to know Christ? You could kind of put a blank there and says, do not destroy with your opinion on blank the one for whom Christ died. What are things that you just take 
solid, immovable stances on that when it comes down to it, they're not biblical. They're just your opinion. I had a friend who was uh, searching for a church. He was without a church body and this independent Baptist church approached him to be their interim pastor. Well, my friend's not independent Baptist. He's Southern Baptist. What's what's the difference? Well, one of the main differences is independent Baptist are King James Version only. Uh, even on their Sunday school material, big stamp on the front, KJV only. And so that is a stance that's going in. He knows they're King James only. That's the only Bible they're going to recognize. So what what's he to do? Go in and have his first sermon be why he uses the New King James or the New American Standard? Go through the history of the translation? No. He owns a King James version of the Bible, so he brings his King James version in and preaches the word, and no, n- nothing wrong with that, right? So while he doesn't agree with their stance on all the other versions of the Bible, he's okay with the King James version of the Bible, right? So it's not a problem. We can be, he could be unified. He's not going to make an issue over doubtful things. So what are the things? That's what we need to pray about. That's what we need to think about. What do we do personally that destroys the one for whom Christ died? What if it's a judgment? What if God tells me to go share my faith with someone, but they're a little scary looking? They don't look like me. They they look kind of rough. Or I've heard things, and I'm not comfortable talking to them. So am I going to let my prejudice, my fear, keep them from knowing Christ? It can be anything. It's just fill in the blank. The point, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. He says, therefore do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. He's saying, don't waste your life bickering over ridiculous small things. Focus on righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Spirit. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. He's saying it takes an effort. You have to sometimes change the way you do things because you consider other people. Because you are considerate of one another. So instead of tearing them down by gossiping and fighting, you're doing the exact opposite. You're saying, you know, personally in my heart, I don't agree with that, but I'm not going to let it separate us. I'm not going to let it be a divisive matter in our lives. We have a monthly pastor prayer meeting with uh, various churches in Laplace. About six or seven churches usually participate. This week we're hosting it here at our church. There will be people... There'll be pastors here of various denominations. And I already know some of our differences, some of our belief differences that we have. And so it takes an effort. It's not hard, though. I mean, if you're focused on caring for people and praying, it's not hard not to bring up those differences, is it? I mean, you really have to go out of your way and be intentional to bring up the differences to try and create a wedge of disunity. We've actually had a couple of people do that over the last four years. And we've had to address that as a body. Say, hey, look, you've got your church to do that in, but that's not a commonly held belief of this this body. We're coming together with our commonality and, and our faith in Jesus Christ as a Christian prayer group. But beyond that, we know we have different faiths represented. We're not going to come together and talk about our differences. So he says, let us pursue. So that reminds me, back in chapter 12, verse 18, he said, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably peaceably with all men. Sometimes it's not possible. 
Sometimes it doesn't depend on you. There's somebody else in the picture. But he says, you do your part. You make sure that you're living peaceably. You can't control what someone else does or says or thinks or makes up or whatever. But do your part. Put forth some effort. Let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Make an effort to not use your uh, your roommate's pot or pan if they don't want it to be used. Don't intentionally use a version of the Bible when you're a guest preacher that you know that church doesn't like. That's altering your way, but you're not going against you're not sinning, are you, in those situations? You're not, you're not doing something that goes against a deeply held conviction. You just know, well, I don't think that way, but they do, and I love them as a brother. And, and uh, in the case of my roommate, he wasn't a brother in Christ, was he? But he's somebody who Jesus died for, isn't he? And that offer of salvation is there for him, and that's why he worded it. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. That would apply to both a believer and a non-believer because every single non-believer, Christ died for them also. And that offer of salvation continues to be available. And God may use your consideration of other people to break down a wall with them. He says all things... In, in verse 20, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. It is good. This uh, verse 21 has a, some similarities with uh, verse 13 that I told you was critical for this understanding chapter 14. This verse 21, in addition to verse 13, is the other highly critical verse for this whole chapter. It is good neither to eat meat, nor drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. So most of what we've talked about and that has been spelled out has been in the offense category, right? Well, if you do that, you're disrespecting them, you're, you're offending them. But here he kind of, talking about stumbling and talking about whether made weak, and he even mentioned drinking wine. So, what if somebody's in the habit of having a, a glass of wine with their meal? And that's just something that they do. And they're having somebody over as a guest. And they either know uh, that person doesn't drink anything out of a religious conviction or that person struggled with alcoholism or we don't know anything about this person but they could not drink as a spiritual conviction or they may struggle with alcohol addiction and we don't know that. Is it that much of a modification of their lifestyle to not, not have it? Or to say, you know what? I don't need people that think differently than me to see this in my cart at the grocery store and, and in a checkout line and then have that cause a wedge between us. So it's those kind of examples where you're like, well, yeah, my personal thoughts on the subject matter but because of the divisiveness that it can bring, because of the weakness, what if someone has been struggling with an addiction, in this case to say alcohol, and they've been not drinking for a long time, and then after spending time with us, they go home and they're extremely tempted. And then the devil starts to work on their thought process and says, well, you respect those people and they do it and they do it in moderation. You haven't had a drink in years and and you're spiritually mature now much more than you were during your alcoholic days and sure you could just have one glass. I mean, what's what what's in what's the problem with that? And then that's where they're made weak. 
That's where they're made to stumble and fall. And so that's where you say, you know what? I'm going to alter either my time with them in that meal or I'm going to alter my entire lifestyle because of that all the time, both public and private. I'm not going to participate in these activities. I'm not going to do these things because even if I can convince myself that there's nothing wrong with that particular activity or recognizing that particular diet or day or whatever it might be. But if I know it's enough of an issue with enough of my brothers and sisters in Christ, just out of love for them, say, out of consideration for others, I'm going to abstain from fill in the blank, whatever it is. So then he says, do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. Think about those last two verses. What he's saying is, you better be fully convinced in your own mind based on the Word of God not just tradition, not just what other people are doing, but whatever things are in your life. He's saying if God does not approve it, you should get rid of it. Whatever that means. Whatever that means. Next Sunday, we're going to be partaking of the Lord's Supper as a church body. The Sunday after that is Resurrection Sunday. It's Easter Sunday. It's two weeks away. So, for the Lord's Supper, we're to basically do two main things every time we have the Lord's Supper. Jesus said that we're to remember the sacrifice. So, while usually we're talking about the victory in Jesus, the power of God, the empty cross, that Jesus isn't dead, He's alive, we worship a risen living Savior, when we have the Lord's Supper, He wants us to remember the cross. He wants us to remember the blood that He shed, the effects that he went into on that cross that there was a price to be paid for our sin and it was the blood of Jesus Christ. And he wants us to reflect on that. That's how much Jesus loves us. That's what makes it easy to be considerate of other people, to say, Jesus died for my sin and all he asked me to do is be considerate? That's not too much to ask. So the second thing, other than remembering the sacrifice that we'll be doing next Sunday, is to self-examine. Just like we talked about minding our own business and not correcting everybody on every little thing that he was talking about in verse 4, it's not me correcting other people of sins I see in their life. It's self-examination. It means to put ourselves on trial. To, to see myself on trial before God, all my sins seen by Him, and for me to pray to God, God, I want to be right with You. I don't want to be living a lifestyle of sin. Everything is open to You. Please reveal all of my sins and my weaknesses to me so that I cannot defend them, so that I will not continue in them, but so that I can be open and honest with you about myself. You know it all anyway. But to over the course of this coming week, starting right now, until we partake of the Lord's Supper together one week from today, to be praying, God, show me where I've sinned. If I've sinned against other people, whether they know it or not, I need to ask forgiveness. And if I've harmed someone in any way, I need to make it right. I need to ask for their forgiveness. If I've gossiped about somebody, I need to go not only ask their forgiveness, but to go correct all the damage that I have done with the same fervor in which I gossiped about them. I need to have that same energy into asking people's forgiveness and to confessing my sin before them. If I borrowed from somebody and did not repay, if I damaged somebody's property and I said, well, you forgive me, but I didn't pay for the property... God, help me to make that right before you. 
So it's a putting ourselves on trial so that when we come together for the Lord's Supper next week, we're in communion with God and as He challenges us, the hard part is with one another. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we thank You for Your Word. God, we thank You for the conviction we get from the preached Word of God that we see that there's so many petty things that are used to be divisive. And He's not saying that things don't matter. He's very particular that He's talking about doubtful things. He's talking about minor things of opinion where we can be different and and still be unified. And so, Lord, I pray that You would convict us uh, both of things that in our past, things currently, and that they'd be used to prevent us from feeling strongly about areas where You have not spoken strongly about. That we would have our opinions mirror Your Word. That our opinions would line up totally and completely with the Word of God. So, Lord, we just pray that this time of invitation would be used for us to pray to You right from where we're at, to confess sins, to to ask You and invite You to speak to us of areas that we need to correct before next Sunday when we come together. And Lord, for those that might be here that may not know You, but are convicted today, say, wow, Jesus loves me. He died for me. He paid the price for my sin. He wants a relationship with me. God, I pray that today would be the day of somebody's salvation. That someone would come up today and say, Pastor, I want to be saved. So Lord, just for us that are already believers and have things to pray to You about, have us to do that from where we're standing. For those that want to know about a relationship with You, have them to come talk to me, Lord, right now. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand.